Well, good morning. I heard that you were all a tough crowd. <laughs> so, Hey, it's great to uh, be with you this morning. Big shoes to fill, and uh, but we'll, we'll do our best here. Now, um, first of all, I, how many of you are familiar with ADF or what we do? Probably a good number of you, yeah. Um, I, I thought, you know, rather than a just a formal Bible study, which I always enjoy doing, um, it might be good to work in some ADF themes and just give you a little sense of who we are, um, what we do. And let me tell you about myself first. I'm an attorney. I'm a senior attorney with ADF. I work with our about 2,000 allied attorneys around the country, in fact, now around the world. And I'm originally from New York. I was in private practice there. I was a litigator in New York for 25 years, and then I came here about eight years ago to work with ADF doing religious liberty work. I left private practice to join the nonprofit world, and it's been a great move. After eight years, though, in uh, Arizona, I confess I still root for the Yankees and the uh, D-backs. I know. I know. <laughs> I find that that's a great relationship builder in other parts of the country. Out of New York, everybody just loves the Yankees and rallies to them. But, but, oh, I like the Mets, too. But I, but I, I do, oh, Red Sox. No, we're not putting up with that. Okay. We're, we're done. That's it. But there's a, but, um, we're, we're kind of in mourning together because I was rooting for the D-backs, too. And I was hoping it would be another World Series like 2001, but the universe would be righted and that would this game seven might have turned out differently this time but this is not meant to be but um so anyway um adf handles religious liberty cases i couldn't really even tell you in the time adequately everything that we do in a very general sense we do a defense of religious liberty uh we protect life sanctity of life cases and we also do a defense of the family and those things uh, branch into lots of topics, lots of d different types of cases. There's hundreds of hundreds of cases going on at any given time. And as I said, it would be difficult to really give you a flavor for it. Uh, but what I'd like to try to do is maybe pull some themes from behind it. Now, before I do, I'm just going to open with this story. Um, I'm on the board of a ministry that meets in Hong Kong. Uh, it's, a, it's an Asian ministry. And my friends who live in Hong Kong told me this story, and they say that this really happened, that people in China know it, that um, it's generally not known in the U.S., uh, not as well. But they say, you know, this, is, this really happened. And the story goes back to, how many of you are old enough to remember uh, ping pong politics and Nixon's visit to China? Good number of you, yeah, a lot of gray hair in here, okay. Well, what happened on that occasion was when um, Nixon was going to visit China and visit Mao. Uh, Mao's health was failing, and you know he was already you know maybe sort of like half senile or something, a dotering, and uh, but the Chinese wanted to present him as as healthy and vibrant and in control of what was happening there. So uh, to make an impression on the president, they drilled him in English phrases so that when he met Nixon, he would impress Nixon. <coughs> Um, and speak some English. And they had about a dozen phrases, and they kept drilling him, and he seemed to be, you know, getting it. So the big moment came, and you all, some of remember, many of you remember the photograph, and they're shaking hands and smiling. And the first question Mao was going to ask is, how are you? And instead, he got a little confused, and he asked, who are you? Well, there was some reaction around there, and, and I guess you know he was urged to continue the conversation. So he pressed forward, and he meant to ask a second question, how do you do? And instead he asked, what do you do? Now, these are not good ways to make an impression on a visiting president. But I would like to suggest to you that they are really profound questions. Who are you, and what do you do? Um, I like to think of those questions often, you know, in 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 sharing with Christians. Sometimes, you know, uh, they're very good questions to ask if you're maybe talking about spiritual gifts or doing a study from Romans chapter 12 or 1 Corinthians 12 to understand who are or how does God 
How, how does God intend for us to fit in in everything that's happening around us? But I think they're profound questions for all of us as well in what we do and how we interact with the culture. And, you know, the culture is always pressing against the church. There are spiritual forces pressing against the church all the time. Um, and what is it that God wants us to do? Who has he made you? Who does he intend you to be in this, uh, you know, in this time in which he's designated for us to live? What gifts has he given you? And again, these are such important questions um, because not only are you talking about God's purposes being done in the culture and in this life, um, but we're also talking about your, you know, our own fulfillment. I mean, one thing that happens is as we get grayer, um, we tend to think less about what we've accumulated in the past, and we tend to think more about um, what did my life matter when I'm gone? Was the world different you know, because I was here? Um, did I, you know, even corny sounding stuff like, did I leave the world better for my being here? What impact you know, did I have? Uh, and I think that when we figure out who we are and what God made us to do, there's, there's just a great joy that comes from that because we're functioning the right way. As a, I mean, one of my favorite movies of all times is Chariots of Fire. And uh, I love this a scene in Chariots of Fire where Eric, Eric Little, who's the, uh, you know, the Scottish runner who's on the way to the Olympics, he's also a Christian and a family, was, they were missionaries to China. He's walking in the, the highlands, the Scottish highlands, and he's with his sister, and his sister's a little upset, and she says, oh, Eric, your head's filled with running and all this kind of thing. And um, some of you could do a better Scottish brogue than me, I'm sure. But the... Um, he t tells her that he t he's decided he's going to run in the Olympics. And he, he turns around, he takes her by the arms, and he says, Jenny, God made me fast. And when I run, I feel his pleasure. To have the gift and to not use it would be to hold him in contempt. And I thought, yeah, I think when you have a gift that God's given you, and everybody has, has a gift or gifts that God's given us. When you, have, when you have the gift and you're using it the way God intended, I tell you, I really believe that you will feel God's pleasure. It gives a sort of a joy and a meaning and a, pers and a perspective to life. You know, without that, it just seems to me, what... Yeah, I wonder sometimes how people who I, I have friends from the old days before I didn't become a Christian until I was 25 and I was well um, on the other side of the uh, you know the political fence and the spiritual fence and and you know I have a lot of friends from those days and then I went to academia and they're atheists and they're kind of you know I remember sort of all the snide humor and the way that we sort of interacted and everything and I think back on that and I almost wonder. It's like, what a bleak existence. What do you, it's like, so you just believe you're some accident here and when it's done and, you know, and, and, uh, and, and, it, and it manifests itself in profound ways. People who get ill think, well, I may as well just end my life. You know, there's nothing to this anyway. You know, and, and there's so many examples in, in our generation, you know, Ernest Hemingway, who, who, who uh, was an atheist, who just struggled with existence and, and meaning. You know, one point in his life, very, very bitterly wrote, our nada, who art nada, hallowed be thy nada. And when he uh, became ill, um, his family locked up his guns. They were afraid what he was going to do. He was, he was sort of driven into this existentialist despair. And sure enough, one day he got the locked case open, put a gun to his mouth, and pulled the trigger. And uh, I remember even reading and, you know, talking in college, having to suffer through courses where you actually talked about existentialists and, and asking questions you know, about the emptiness of life and, and, and all that. And the, um, it, I'm sorry, I wasn't going to say it, but I'll, it, it was just reminds me of a funny line. Um, it was from a, um, I don't usually like to quote him because he's a, not a favorite guy of mine, but he's occasionally very funny, Woody Allen. It was an early movie of his where somebody says to him, you know, a good place to meet uh, women is an art museum. He said, I don't know anything about art. Yeah, you don't have to. You just hang out there and ask women, what do you think of that painting? What does it mean to you? 
and you'll start a conversation, and you'll meet women. Oh, he says, that sounds good. So he goes to an art museum, and there's this woman dressed in black, and she's got a cigarette holder, and there's this painting, and he says to her, uh, well, what do you think of that? And she says, what, what do you see in that? And she says, I see blackness, despair, and death. I see the agony of mankind spiraling down, you know, all this kind of thing. And then he says, well, what are you doing Saturday night? <laughs> and she says, committing suicide. And he says, well, how about Friday night? <laughs> <laughs> all right, I'm sorry for that digression. Um, I, I do want to talk about some of the cases we handle, though, and, and not even so much the cases, and, and a lot of you know about ADF and the things we do, but to just give you a perspective on what's behind it. And when you understand some of these forces, I think it helps us to see what's coming as well. Now, you know, hearkening back to China for a moment, you know, uh, we all, many of us remember the Cold War. And one thing about the Cold War was, there wasn't direct conflict, but there were lots of proxy battles. Um, there was tension, you know, between North and South Korea. There was tension at different parts of the world and flashpoints in Eastern Europe. And sometimes there's a tendency for people to look at a flashpoint and think that that's the battle. And to not understand, there are great currents um, underneath. There are forces that are moving that are that are dictating these events. And sometimes what we're seeing is just a little outplaying. And we don't want to get so focused on the event that we, um, that we miss what's underneath it. But occasionally, something happens in the, with the event that clicks for us, and we say, yeah, this is not right. There's something happening here that's wrong. Um, and, and let me just start with just one little example. You know, the scripture tells us that the cross of Christ is an offense. Um, I've found even in the public debate, the name of Jesus is an offense to the people on the other side of our cases. It, it's an interesting thing. They don't get upset. You know, the ACLU won't file a lawsuit if somebody puts up a little Buddha statue or something like that, even though an awful lot of people believe that this is, uh, you know, a deity. Um, but there's something that happens when you mention the name of Jesus Christ or the cross in particular that creates an offense. And the first current that I see that really explains a lot of this is Ephesians 6.12, which tells us our wrestling, our struggle, is not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. It's against wickedness and, and high spiritual places. And so you, we understand that this really is, at its core, a spiritual battle. But it takes odd forms. Now, for example, a group like the ACLU, which you know, and, and I want to be charitable, I, and I think, you know, that there are people, I have, I have friends who, um, you know, sort of support some of what they do, and they say, well, at least, you know, they're for limiting government interference in our lives in certain ways and all that, and I, I try to be polite, and privately I'm thinking, you know, even a, a broken clock is right twice a day, but I'm not, I'm not saying that. I just said it, so that wasn't much good. All right. I needed more coffee before starting this today. To be, but the, um, but we, we see their, their view of the world at times, and, it, and it, we understand the currents underneath that. And I find we might, you know, I might be debating somebody from the ACLU in a difficult, on a difficult issue, but I like to ask them, okay, but tell us then more about your vision for America. What does America look like? if you have your way. And when you get them talking and, and people hear about the agenda or they see the manifestations of it, they get it, they understand, and they say, no, no, th this is not what we're about as a culture, as a nation, as a people. Um, and there are times that it really hits forcefully. Uh, you know, it's a, I, I'm, one example, we're in a, a, locked in a battle with them over crosses throughout the country. Um, we're representing, for example, veterans groups. We're working with the largest veterans groups in the country. We have a great project with the American Legion, and uh, there are groups like the VFW. And they are outraged over lawsuits that are trying to remove crosses from military memorials. And you have to understand, these people would literally go into Arlington Cemetery and say, it's government property, we want to tear down crosses. Some of them, you know, we have the 
Canadian Cross of Sacrifice, a gift from uh, from a Canadian Prime Minister, a, a Canadian Prime Minister in the beginning of the 20th century. You have the Argonne Cross. You have these beautiful memorial crosses. Um, I had a general one time at one of their events ask me, "Are they going to sue to take away my Distinguished Service Cross because they don't like the shape of the award?" Now. This is the military. These are these are veterans, and I really enjoy being with these guys. You know, they're uh, they're interesting after hours. They're very patriotic. They're they stand firm on American values. Their language gets a little salty at times, and they're just a, they're just a they're just a great great group of guys and, and men and women, I should say. And I just I really enjoy being with them and working with them. But you know, this is not this is not sort of the religious right, whatever that means, you know, this is the heart and soul of America, understanding what an agenda looks like. Or another case that we just asked the Supreme Court to review, we represent state troopers in the state of Utah. And Utah allows state troopers who die in the line of duty to be memorialized by a roadside cross, placed there by their families. Uh, maintained by their families, paid for by their families. And on that cross, there's a picture of the officer, a description of what happened. Often there are little sentiments put by the family. Typically there are flowers. And somebody from the American Atheist, when I say the ACLU, I'm referring to them largely to a group of organizations that share a similar agenda. You know, there are groups too, like Freedom From Religion Foundation, American Atheists, Americans United for Separation of Church and State. But they filed suit, and they go to court, and they say, this roadside memorial is an effort to establish the Christian faith. It's a Christian symbol, and I find it offensive, and therefore it must be removed. Now, it, their views don't reflect and the state of Utah's against them. The state troopers are furious about this. Everybody's angry about this. And you have to understand how weirdly inverted their world gets. I mean, I've been in debates where I've said, you know, ask somebody, when you see a cross on the side of the road, what, what do people see? They'll say, well, they see a Christian symbol. They see an effort to establish the Christian faith. Now, think about this. You're driving down the road. You're around a bend. And there on the side of the road, you see a little cross hammered in with flowers at the bottom of it. Would you turn to your spouse and say, oh, hey, look. Somebody there's trying to establish the Christian faith in the side of the road. Yeah, that's pretty interesting. Look at that. It doesn't even occur to rational people that somebody's trying to do that. It wouldn't occur to a rational person that it's anything but a memorial, that somebody died at that location. One that really has us outraged, and this one hits me strongly personally. And this is a, it's a little too small for you to see, but I think I'll pass it around because it's worth it. When I was in New York, my firm represented... Um, New York City retired firefighters. You know, many of our clients suffered uh, family losses that day. One of our clients had two sons, a firefighter and a police officer. They both died in 9-11. While people were trying to get out of the collapsing towers, they were running in trying to save lives. And um, the day after, uh, this client um, was, was in the rubble. At, at that time, in the beginning, sort of anybody who had credentials could get in to help look for bodies and, or survivors or anything. Nobody knew what was happening. Nobody knew what was up. And he had a camera in his pocket, and he stumbled into a clearing. And a construction worker said, come here, you have to see this. And, and in the clearing, they saw a fragment of steel remaining, and I'll pass it around, and maybe you could just keep it going, it'll get back here, that formed something like a cross. Well, it was a remarkable thing. It was on the front page of all the newspapers in New York, I recall. Uh, this is a picture from the original role that he, that he took. And um, construction workers everywhere just felt like this was a little symbol of hope. One construction worker said, we felt like God had not abandoned us. And yet, this American atheist group filed suit and took those very quotes and said, see, oh, and I'm sorry, let me back up. I didn't give you the context. The city of New York wants to include that, that piece of scrap metal, roughly shaped like a cross, in a 9-11 memorial and museum. And even though it was not made by human hands, at least not, not directly, 
there was a lawsuit filed. You know, at times it's almost humorous. Somebody in the lawsuit complained that if we're going to have a cross, I want a Lutheran cross. Now, I wasn't aware that random forces tearing apart buildings and collapsing them uh, was, you know, that such forces were prone to forming identifiable denominational crosses. But in the, in the eyes of one of the plaintiffs, this was the case. And, um, and, <clears throat> and so they have filed suit. And, and New Yorkers are outraged over this. Uh, this was a symbol of hope. This was a symbol people took with them. But this is the kind of world that they advocate for. And so in debates, we'll go through a list of their interpretation of the First Amendment and what life looks like. So here's their interpretation of the First Amendment. Um, let's take high schools. High schools should not be allowed to say the Pledge of Allegiance because it contains the dread words under God. Now, never mind, no student has to say it. The Supreme Court has already said that. They shouldn't even have to hear the Pledge of Allegiance because if they hear the words under God, it could damage them. Now, the same ACLU would turn around and say the very same First Amendment has another interesting meaning in high school. What's that? If a high school wants to put filters on their computers, so that students don't accidentally, or maybe even intentionally, access pornographic websites, they can't do that, that that's a violation of the First Amendment. So the, the First Amendment, in their eyes, mandates that high school students be accidentally exposed to the worst forms of pornography. There's nothing you can do about that. But that they shouldn't hear the Pledge of Allegiance, or that our currency you know, should not say, in God we trust. There should be no national motto, in God we trust. There should be no um, understanding of our religious heritage. Uh, they've sued to get rid of military chaplains. How can we have a chaplain in the field actually paid for by the Army? Well, you know something? When you put uh, our military in harm's way and they're risking their lives for our freedoms, maybe it's a good thing that we, we have chaplains so that people can connect with their deepest, most intimate feelings of faith and, and, um, and, you know, and, and understand a perspective on what we're asking them to do. Or, you know, what else does it look like? Well, they've sued over invocations. There are towns that have had cities that have had invocations, opening prayers, you know, for time immemorial. They've sued over legislative prayers, even though the practice of prayer before a legislative body goes back to the Continental Congress. Uh, they've sued over the National Day of Prayer. We got involved in the defense of the National Day of Prayer. Horrible that a president would sign a proclamation asking people to humble themselves and maybe consider uh, appealing to a higher power, you know, to their understanding. And, and, and they, these things couldn't be more bland. You know, these proclamations are almost like to whom it may concern, you know, uh, if, if you're up there, you know, we ask you to kind of help out if, that, if you do that sort of thing. Not quite as bad as that, but, but they, they're, the point is they're very, very bland. They're not sectarian in any way. And yet, you know, these are the kinds of cases, these are the sort of suits that they bring. They'll attack, um, they'll attack religious symbols. They'll go after the town that has a little nativity scene that's been out there for more than a century. Um, and, and the really, to me, the part of this that really gets to me is their constitutional harm is they claim that they are offended. The Supreme Court created a narrow exception where they don't have to actually even have true constitutional harm. They, uh, they can simply say, the sight of that thing offends me. Now, let me ask you a question. Any of you ever see anything in your normal course of the day that offends you? All right. Does it even occur to you that you should make a federal case out of this? Well, I don't think so. And I think that this is one of the things that really, really hits people in the debate when they hear it to the point that they really don't even like to debate us and they don't like to show up because they have to stand there and say that I'm offended by this symbol, by this cross, by this Ten Commandments memorial, whatever. And if I'm on the other side of that, I'm talking about my clients. I'm talking about retired firefighters. And I say, isn't that interesting? This is a memorial to honor people who prized and lived out and demonstrated courage, selflessness, sacrifice. These were people who ran into the building while others were trying to get out. 
These are the people we should emulate in society. These are the people we should respect and we should honor. And here you're taking all of the highest, most noble human aspirations and you want to flip that and say something like your petty offense should carry the day. That your thin-skinned offense that you see something that you don't like should become, should be elevated to constitutional harm. Now, um, you know, how did this thing get so far? Let me just give you a brief rundown on this because I think people of goodwill do get confused by the subject. We hear, for example, you know, ad nauseum, the so-called separation of church and state. How many people think the separation of church and state is found in the Constitution or the Declaration of Independence? Anybody? Okay, you're a sophisticated group. You're also not risking raising your hand looking wrong. I know why you're thinking. I should force you all to vote on where it comes from, but we won't do that. The, the, the idea of the separation of church and state is not in the Constitution. Um, what the First Amendment says, and uh, by the way, is simply this. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. That's all it says. All the separation stuff gets wrenched out of that little phrase. And look at that phrase carefully. Congress, as in Congress, shall make no law, as in don't you go passing any laws, respecting an establishment of religion, as in don't establish a national religion. What was the concern there? We didn't want another Church of England. We didn't want a state, a federal in particular, I should, because individual states had state-established religions, and that was okay in their eyes. We didn't want a federally established religion. It had nothing to do with hostility against religion. In fact, um, immediately, so nobody would miss the point, the First Amendment continues in really one clause and says, or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. Don't you go passing laws, Congress, that prohibit the free exercise of religion. Now, what was behind all of this? These founders, whether they were Christian or not, and many of them were Christian, the people on the other side of the debate are fond of taking a few people, notably Jefferson, maybe Franklin, and saying, oh, they were deists, and that characterized the founding fathers. They were deists. They weren't really into this Christianity stuff. And if anything, they were very suspicious of Christianity. It's complete nonsense. It, it, is, a, it is a weird distortion of history, and anybody who wants to investigate it even a little bit can see that. And this is what the founders understood. Let's, you know, what did Jefferson understand? Jefferson wrote the Declaration of Independence. Jefferson, we all acknowledge, was sort of a deist. He had this kind of view that God sort of wound things up and then let it go and let it run on its own. It wasn't so much intervening the way theists believe. Uh, but when Jefferson wrote the Declaration of Independence, you know, he said, we hold these truths to be self-evident. Now, let me pause there. These are lofty words, so we tend to mi miss the meaning of them. What does self-evident mean? That means this is so obvious, it doesn't even require explanation. It's evident on its face. This is like saying water is wet. This is such basic stuff. If any of you have, you know, teenage kids or grandkids, it's they, they what they would say, duh, you know, kind of thing. But here's Jefferson saying, we hold these truths to be self-evident. These are obvious to us, what that all men are created equal and endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. Among these are life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. Now, here's what they were saying. The source of rights is our creator. Why was that so important? Why was that so significant? Because there was a debate at that time. There's one of two sources of rights. Rights either come from God or they come from government, the state. The French decided that rights came from government, from the state. Now, that means if government gives you rights when government wants, it can take away rights. That means if you happen to live in Stalin's Russia or Mao's China or Pol Pot's regime, that your rights are as good as the government decides they should be. And they got the picture and they said no. That's an affront to essential human dignity. But the only way to check government authority was to say there's a source of rights greater than government. 
The source of, that, of those rights is God himself. So that when government does not act in accordance with God's principles, then we're free to overthrow government because that's an unjust government. They were, they were advocating for a kind of limited government because government itself had to answer to a higher authority. And this was the beautiful, self-evident truth um, to them. And this was going to be the basis for founding the nation. Now, where did the words separation of church and state come from then? Well, they came from a letter that Thomas Jefferson wrote to a little church, a Baptist church in Danbury, Connecticut. What happened was after Jefferson was elected, this church wrote him a letter, and they basically said, and I'm paraphrasing, Mr. President, we're so glad you're elected because we're really afraid. Uh, the Baptists were disfavored. You know, the Puritans and the Congregationalists really looked down upon them. They were kicked out of, you know, Massachusetts and all. They were banished to what the, they called the cesspool of all religious faith, which was Rhode Island. They put up with things. And, and let's not even get started about the Quakers, who we push off into Pennsylvania. And let's not even mention the Catholics, who are going to have to go down to Maryland and all this sort of thing. So they wrote to Jefferson and they said, you get it, Mr. President. Um, we're really afraid that our rights are going to be crushed by a, a government you know, uh, view, a correct government view. And Jefferson wrote a brief letter back to them. And he, and he sa basically said to them, your fears are not justified because you're protected by a wall of separation of church and state. He used a metaphor of a wall of separation to explain why their free exercise of religion could not be attacked by a government-run church. It was a protection. It was a separation so that, so that people could worship according to the dictates of their conscience, even if they happened to be Baptist. They were going to let them get away with that at that time. So, th but this was what Jefferson had on his mind. Now, the same Thomas Jefferson did what a few days after writing that letter? He turned around and he went to Christian worship services held, guess where? The U.S. Capitol. Government closed down on Sunday because they needed the U.S. Capitol to hold distinctly Christian worship services. And local ministers commented, well, you want to say about Jefferson? He's really good. He's, he's, he gets here even when it rains. He gets on his horse and gets down here. And they were very impressed by that. And he did more than that. He ordered the U.S. Marine Corps Band to play worship. Now, how could I describe this to you today? If, the, if, if a president today, without naming him, uh, tried to do something like that, and the ACLU caught wind of it, how would they react? Remember the movie The Exorcist years ago, where Linda, like the head spinning around, and the, that would be how they would react. It would be like unthinkable. This is the most heinous crime of all time. So they, they look at Jefferson, and they say, oh, he wanted this kind of separation. If they had told Jefferson, uh, don't you agree we shouldn't use crosses to memorialize our military dead, I think Jefferson would have thought they were either joking or he might have even suggested that they should be tarred and feathered for such a, a weird view because Jefferson got the idea of morality. Or they'll look at George Washington. I've heard radio shows with academics and debates where they say, and Washington was very suspicious of religion. Washington did not want any form of religion influencing government. It's somebody's weird nightmare. Here's George Washington's farewell address. You can find it yourself on the internet. Read what he, he was really, by the way, nervous about having alliances with foreign countries. But here's what he said. Of all the dispositions and habits which lead to political prosperity, religion and morality are indispensable supports. In vain would that man claim the tribute of patriotism who would labor to subvert these great pillars of human happiness, these firmest props of the duties of men and citizens. And he basically went on to say that, you, you know, you, that if you don't have a sense of religion or morality, he, you, you're really not fit for leadership. Or Benjamin Franklin, um, fascinating guy, you know, scallywag and you know, interesting career. And they look at Franklin and they say, oh, Franklin certainly would not have approved of this. Well, Google sometime Franklin's appeal for prayer at the Constitutional Convention when everything was breaking down over the issue of slavery. And, and Franklin 
tried to get people to pull together and, and uh, basically say, okay, we're going to have to get past some of these, these horrible issues. We know we'll deal with them sooner or later. But he gave this speech where he appealed to the creator of the universe. Uh, I mean, here's part of what he said. This is Benjamin Franklin, not particularly you know, known for his faith. Beginning of the contest with Great Britain when we were sensible of danger, we had daily prayer in this room for divine protection. Our prayers, sir, were heard and they were graciously answered. All of us who were engaged in the struggle must have observed frequent instances of a superintendent providence in our favor. Goes on later to say, sir, a long time and the longer I live, the more convincing proofs I see of this truth that God governs in the affairs of men. And if a sparrow cannot fall to the ground without his notice, kind of a distinctly Christian reference, is it probable that an empire can rise without his aid? We have been assured, sir, in the sacred writings that except the Lord build a house, they labor in vain that build it. I firmly believe this, and I also believe without his concurring aid, we shall succeed in this political building no better than the builders of Babel. And he then went on to to uh, move that they start every session in prayer, which was carried. This is our history. This is our tradition. And yeah, the AC, groups like the ACLU have this weirdly inverted notion of, of, what, um, you know, of what, what the Constitution allegedly says or what our history says. And you know, they, they have built on this. And again, I, I think you know, part of the, well, let me hold off on that thought. I just share this as well. Some of you are old enough to remember actually maybe reciting prayers in school. You're old enough to remember a time that these issues were not such a big deal. Um, what happened? What was the turnaround? The turnaround really came in a U.S. Supreme Court case in 1947 where a Supreme Court Justice, Hugo Black, took Jefferson's metaphor and he wrenched it out of context. And he applied the metaphor, not the way Jefferson did, to you're protected from government intrusion by the separation of church and state. He applied it instead against the church in limiting religious expression. He actually inverted the meaning of it in the context of this case. Now, it turns out that the case was decided the right way regardless of that. But he started a course deviation, which didn't look so terrible there. But given time, we all know what happens um, as you, pers as you fl move out along that, de that deviated line. And that started a trend where the, and the ACLU and groups like that built on that trend. And they're very open about this. They, they advertise. They look for plaintiffs. They explain that this was their vision. And then one of the things they finally got a court to do sort of midway through this battle was they said, OK, how did the government always view this establishment idea? This is the way they viewed it. You should not prefer one religion to another. What does that mean? That means if a government provides a benefit, but it, you get it if you're Baptist, but not if you're Catholic, or if you're Catholic, but not Jewish, that that's wrong. Now, that's a correct use of the Establishment Clause. Government cannot prefer one religion to another. Well, they twisted that again. And they, in the decades to follow, said, no, no, no. This is the right meaning of the Establishment Clause. Government cannot prefer religion to non-religion. You can't even prefer religion to non-religion. Now, once you get a court to accept that view, what's safe? Well, nothing. Because any time you even mention the word of God ceremonially, you've preferred religion to non-religion. And so in the decades that follow, there were cases that built upon this. And we had this erosion of our religious liberties that compounded. It actually led to the founding of the Alliance Defense Fund because it was in the you know, early 90s that some of our founders, our leaders, people like Dr. Dobson, Dr. Bill Bright, Dr. D. James Kennedy, Larry Burkett, many others, got together to study why is it we're, we've lost our religious liberties? What's happened to this country? Where are all these cases coming from? What's the agenda behind it? And their study led them to the conclusion that, that these groups had orchestrated this and that we had not shown up for the fight. 
uh, we basically lost by default. It wasn't that they had better lawyers and more clever arguments. We were losing by default. And so ADF was launched in 1994. And you know, part of what I love today is with the number of direct litigators we have and the, the allied attorney network we have, we've actually become the largest such organization in the world. It's very humbling to think of this. Um, we're committed that there will never be a religious liberty battle in this country that we lose by default. We will be there. And, you know, by God's grace, we've been successful in 80% of the cases that we've been involved in. And I think sometimes, you know, part of that is just the other side so overreaches. Um, and, and when people get the vision that they have for this country, it startles them because let's take it further. If you have a vision where you can marginalize religion, you cannot criticize the government, you can have st a state-endorsed correct position, you all, pr you all use the power of the state to oppose people who don't agree with your dictates. What happens? Well, you've started down the road to the worst totalitarian regimes. Is it any coincidence that these regimes are officially atheist? No, it's no coincidence that, that this is the case because you don't want yourself subject to a higher value. So, um, you know, this is the way that, the, um, that, that this thing developed. And it really came to focus for a lot of us in a case in 2005. In 2005, the Supreme Court heard two decisions on whether you can have a Ten Commandments memorial. Seems to be pretty straightforward. We're all saying, finally, we're going to get some clear, clear guidance on this now. And what happened in, that, in those cases? One Ten Commandments memorial won in a five to four vote. The other one lost in a five to four vote. And many judges and law review articles are equipped afterward that not only did they not clear it up, it's more confusing than ever. It's a really weird standard. But the interesting thing was you had judges on the side who want to strike down all of these memorials saying, hey, it's really critical we look to the last 60 years, and that's the basis of what we, we do in our jurisprudence. 60 years is so important. Now, nobody has asked these justices, why 60 years? That's a rather arbitrary number. And even more recent than 60 years, you know, one of the icons of the left, William O. Douglas, acknowledged in a Supreme Court decision, he said, we are a religious people whose institutions presuppose a supreme being, he said in a case called Zorak v. Clausen. Now, why do they want to look back 60 years? Because that takes you back to that 1947 window where you have uh, Justice Hugo Black taking the separation of church and state metaphor and inverting it to prevent religious expression, to prevent religious influence. Here's the next thing, and we're going to run out of time, but I do want to hit some of this. I wanted to give a feel for some of the forces behind this. There are, prof there are profound spiritual battles here. There are philosophical battles and how we see the world. I think the other thing that's behind a lot of what we fight and a lot of what we deal with in the culture is now a culture of relativism. It's a culture in which increasingly we, we're taught, children are taught in schools, that there's no such thing as absolute truth. It's interesting, I've had lunch the other day with a young man who's got a college ministry, shares the, the gospel in a lot of the public universities, and he said to me, I've never seen a time that, that these students are, were so empty and so questioning and so willing to look at the gospel because they've been so thoroughly raised to believe there's no absolute truth, and it throws them off. They want to know what is life about. They want to know, is there a cause for which they can live? They're looking for meaning. They've been deprived meaning, and they're not doing well as a result of that. And this relativism teaches that there's no such thing as absolute truth, and it takes various forms. Now, the thing about this is if you look at this for even a little while, it's not an intellectually supportable idea. You know, I can actually remember a debate a long time ago where somebody said to me, uh, well, there's no absolute truth. There's no, things can't even be known. We can't even know. He get, it was getting into what's called epistemological, like ph philosophically, how can we even know things? He was starting to go down that trail. He said, how can we even know anything? He said, thoughts are nothing more than radical, random electrical impulses running around your brain. We can't even rely on thoughts. Well, you talk about 
teeing it up for you, you know, the pro what was the problem with that that I had to gently point out to him that you used a thought to reach that conclusion. So uh, then therefore your thought isn't even reliable. If you're going to get to that level, then nothing means anything. Then it's anarchy. You know, I think G.K. Chesterton once said something like, he said, I he said I'm open-minded, but I like to open my mind the way I open my mouth. I like to close it down on something solid. And I, you know, I think that that's a good point. But this relativism, it afflicts us. Like typically, if we're involved in one of our cases, yeah, you know, I've been in debates where somebody will stand up in the audience and they'll say, yes, I have a question. Yes, what's the question? Who are you to impose your religious morality on me? What if I don't believe like you? You're imposing it. Well, sometimes this will happen to thunderous applause, as if God just spoke from Mount Sinai. A profound truth has been uttered. Now, you know, Galatians 6.1 says that, you, that we should correct somebody in a fall with a spirit of gentleness and be aware of our own insufficiencies and all this kind of thing. And these are young people, and sometimes, you know, they just, the, the product of this half-baked education and culture. So, you know, you do it gently. You say, well, no, let me ask you a question then. Um, I suppose that you're upset that William Wilberforce used his very Christian morality to crusade to end slavery uh, in the British Empire. And people, by the way, said to him what you're saying to me now. Who are you to use your morality? You're probably upset that he did that. Well, they can't say that. Uh, or I suppose that you're, I, I think the great moral movement of our time was the, uh, there's another one coming, but I think the great moral movement was the civil rights movement. So, and it was distinctly Christian. The Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King used his very basic Christian beliefs and biblical teaching to attack the Im immorality uh, of, of racism. And so I'll say, I suppose you're upset that Dr. King did that, that he made his Christian faith the basis of what he was saying. That probably bothers you. Well, they don't want to say that. Or they even asked him a simpler question. I suppose that you have no problem with a culture like Nazi Germany and its various extermination programs. Uh, I guess there's no issue for you with that, right? Well, no, he'll say that's wrong what they did. Well, why is it wrong? If there's no absolute truth, who cares whether what they did was right or wrong. You can't say that. Then Nuremberg was wrong. We should not have judged them. Well, now they don't know what to say because of course you have to have a standard of right and wrong or nothing means anything. But they don't see this thing. And this is the other spiritual thing that occurs to me. And that is there's been an inversion in this culture of the idea even of rights. where It's become a culture that's almost obsessed with and worships rights. And I think that this is an important point. Romans chapter 1 talks about when people deny the knowledge of God in creation itself. The Apostle Paul said that gives them over to all kinds of problems. And one of the things he describes is he says, they turn and they worship man-made things instead of the God who created them. And, and this, I think, is a profound point because when our when the founders of this country thought of the idea of having rights, they were not worshiping the rights. They saw the rights as a mechanism to have a moral structure that recognized that God was above government. Rights were a mechanism. Imagine you went to a city and visited its zoo. And let's say this is back in the days when zoos still had bars. So you're, you're killing some time and you're walking and you're going along. And the, you come to the first cage, and it's empty. And the tour guide says, now look at these bars over here. These are 3 16th inch galvanized steel. They're about six inches apart. Everybody goes, ooh, yeah, ooh, very nice. And then you go to the next cage. We're really proud of these. These are, these are cast iron bars. They're about 12 inches apart. Again, the cage is empty. And the guide's going on admiring the bars. And people are going, ooh, yeah, yeah. Now, after a point, you'd say, all right, I think that they, they missed the point here. Um, the bars were meant to be a mechanism to let you see animals. Um, the bars were not meant to be worshipped, and yet this is what happens. The other side takes the concept of a right instead of the moral good, and they elevate and begin to worship the right like that's the greatest, highest good. And that totally distorts the discussion. You see, God has some simplistic ideas. God is not simplistic, but God has simplistic ideas for us because if we complicate it, we mess it up. So, you know, God says good is, here's how you should think of things, good and evil. You should choose good 
and not bad. You should choose this day whom you will serve. Uh, Jesus said, let your yes be yes and your no be no. Don't complicate it beyond that. You complicate it, you know. God said, woe to those who call good evil and evil good. God is concerned with this very basic thing of, is something good or is something bad? Because if it's good, it's good because he said so and it's good for us. If it's bad, it harms us. And as our, you know, and as a heavenly father, it, it not only does it separate us from him, it hurts him when we hurt ourselves, the same way any of us, if we're fathers, are hurt when we see our kids pursuing something that's bad, that's, that's harmful. But what the other side does with this is they invert it and they say, well, you know, take a subject like, let's say, a horrible child pornography. Everybody would say child pornography should be illegal. Well, they'll say, well, hold on, hold on. Shouldn't I have the right, though? to see what I'm going to view. If government interferes with my right to see what I want to see, isn't that wrong? Well, I mean, if you can do that, then maybe they can tell you you can't read your Bible. Well, that makes people pause for a moment. Well, I don't know, is that a good point or not? Or they'll look at an issue like, let's say, abortion. And, and in that debate, they'll say, instead of saying abortion is evil, they'll say, well, hold on, shouldn't there be a right to choose? Shouldn't there be a right for me to live in this kind of lifestyle to define who I am? Shouldn't I have a, and they turn the question away from good and evil, which God is concerned with, and it becomes a question of rights. And so the rights get elevated. And the man-made thing that was supposed to protect the morality that we needed for the culture gets, uh, gets put on the bottom of those rights. So we're in a right-infested country. Okay, I'm going to end on this thought because um, I'm already over time and I wanted to leave you time for questions. Let me just say, say this. There's all these cultural forces that we're aware of, spiritual forces, relativism, and all these things. I think God puts us in a different, in different, you know, God's ordained for you to live in this time. I was so happy to leave private practice and work for a nonprofit. We're not always thrilled with what nonprofits can legally pay, but um, I would not trade places with anybody in the world because I... I am so incredibly fulfilled. It is such a blessing. Every attorney I work with here feels the same way. We feel like a band of brothers and there's sisters in there too. And, and um, because there's something, there's meaning. There's, there's something in us that connects. I'm going to be able to look at my children and my grandchildren. My first grandchild's on the way. I'm really happy about that. I can spoil them like crazy and get back at the kids. And... Um, <laughs> And, you know, and, and I'll be able to face myself and say, okay, what did I do in my life, in my generation? What, what stand did I take for God? And the thought I maybe want to leave with you is this. You may not be an attorney, but you're in a place of influence in the culture. You're in a place where you're going to see business practices that are maybe unethical. You're in a place where you're going to see people living in a way or doing things that, that's wrong because it's become typical of the culture and how the culture thinks. And my challenge to you is what's more important than finding out who we are and what God wants us to be in this culture? How about, you know, we pray and we ask ourselves, what, how do you intend me to stand for truth and who you are to display the love of Jesus Christ in a world that's spiraling out of control in so many ways? So um, I think that those are good questions for us. And before... We have questions. I just I would like the privilege to pray for you all, if that's okay. Heavenly Father, I thank you for every man who's here today. I thank you for the time we could spend together and share and, and get to know each other. And Father, I ask for a blessing upon them. I ask, Lord, that even now in a, in a time of prayer and reflection afterward, that you would speak to all of our hearts. Lord, let us be challenged with those questions. Who am I? What do I do? And Lord, let us think about the ways that you want us to live for your kingdom, for your truth, because we are in a world that so desperately needs truth, that needs to know about your amazing grace and love and salvation. I pray a blessing upon them, Lord, whatever their circumstances might be, that they would be effective and used by you. In Jesus' name, amen.